for the encouragement. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk to you about some new ideas we have for using a classical approach, asymptotic or perturbation methods, but in a projection context in a way that we think has a lot of potential for multi-scale problems. So projection methods are a very general technique whereby we approximate a solution, say, to a differential equation through a trial function, which is just a linear combination of a set of basis functions. And so those, those basis functions, there's different ways to get them or select them. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we use Galerkin projection, which is really at the center of all this, to take this framework, this trial function with the given basis functions to produce a system of equations for the coefficients. Okay, so the Glurkin projection, again, is at the center. We have the source of the basis functions, and we have the various applications. So, for example, spectral numerical methods. We pre-select our basis functions, Fourier modes, Chebyshev polynomials, based on their orthogonality, their ease of, or, of integration, and so forth. And then through Glurkin projection, we end up with the system of equations to solve for the coefficients. In finite element methods, we have our pre-selected shape functions. Again, we, we've selected them ahead of time. Then there's been a lot of emphasis recently on data-driven approaches. Uh, the classical approach would be a least, least squares regression, where we take our data and we have a least squares estimation process. Or a little more sexy is reduced order modeling approaches, where we take some feature extraction methods, such as POD, proper orthogonal decomposition, or some other similar method. And we extract the basis functions from the data itself, so the data from the system, experimental data, numerical data from the system. And then that gives us, through the Glurkin projection again, the reduced order model that we can then use in control or optimization settings and so on. So there's been, again, a lot of emphasis on a data-driven approach, not so much on a model-driven approach. So there's, I've just listed here a couple of uh, kind of classical but very, very limited model-driven techniques where, for example, in diagonalization, you have a first-order system of differential equations. The eigenvectors can be used as the basis vectors for solving the system of equations. Uh, eigenfunction expansions, eigenfunctions of self-adjoint differential operators, same idea. So, so those are, of course, are very limited. They are not of general interest to us. So clearly, the success of our projection method hinges on the, the quality of the basis functions. So just arbitrary selecting, arbitrarily selecting them ahead of time is, is very easy, but they don't necessarily, and of course probably don't have any underlying system behavior contained within the basis functions. In a data-driven context, they, they do, but it's indirect. It's through, through the data itself, not through the model, if we have a model of the system. So what I want to propose is a, a new idea that we have for a model-driven approach using asymptotic basis functions, which come from an asymptotic expansion and then run that through the Galerkin projection to produce what we're calling a reduced physics model. And I, I call an RPM, a reduced physics model, emphasize the fact that not only are we getting a reduced order model of the system, but that reduced order model, not just fewer degrees of freedom, but it has physical information about the system from the model itself. So just a one slide review of asymptotic or perturbation methods. So we have our asymptotic expansion. It includes the gauge functions, which are functions of our small parameter epsilon. And then we have each order, u1, u2, u3, and so forth, that then we sum up to get our asymptotic expansion as approximation for the solution. So the, the gauge functions are an asymptotic sequence, right? So each one is asymptotically smaller than the previous one. The beauty of these approaches is you get a lot of information about the physics of the problem. So the process of getting the distinguished limit, the leading order balances within the equation, gives you the dominant physics of, of your, your problem. So it's very informative to do, but again, the, the emphasis here is on what more can we do to use the outcome of the asymptotic expansion in a projection method context. So in asymptotic methods themselves, without anything else, all we can do to improve the accuracy is either have smaller epsilons or increase the number of terms in our asymptotic expansions. And because these are asymptotic, they only require a small number of terms to get a pretty good agreement, usually with, with exact solutions. So what I'm going to do is, because this is a new approach and because I'm just kind of rolling this out and I want to try it out and test it, we're just going to use two simple ODE examples 
One is a standard regular perturbation problem, and then a singular perturbation problem, which is more, uh, has the multi-scale character. So in the regular perturbation problem, I really, I've, I have two things I want to show you. So the first is, as I'll make clear in a couple of slides, the, the RPM coefficients, those C coefficients that we get after we do the Galerkin projection, those should approach one as the small parameter goes to zero. So that's a good, that's a nice consistency check. Does the Galerkin projection produce the expected result as epsilon goes to zero? The second thing, more powerful thing that I want to show you is that by, you know, the, the knock-on asymptotic methods, of course, is that they're great, they're beautiful, they're, they're nice, but they only apply for small epsilon. But what I want to show you is that for even rather large order one epsilons, using the asymptotic expansions as asymptotic basis functions through the Galerkin projection, we can get solutions that for order one epsilon that are actually quite good, well beyond what would be the case for just the asymptotic expansion itself. So here it is, simple ODE, second order, and you'll notice that the small parameter is multiplying the first root of term, so it's a regular perturbation problem. Uh, so I write down my, my uh, differential operator on the right-hand side, and then I'll run through quickly the, first, the two steps. Okay, so the this, this first step is just standard asymptotic methods. I'll go through it quickly where we get the asymptotic basis functions. Okay, so that's the model-driven approach to getting the asymptotic basis functions. And then the second step is once we have those basis functions, we use the Galerkin projection to get the C, the, the RPM coefficients, uh, as we project the governing equation, this original governing equation, back onto those basis functions. So it's a regular perturbation expansion. The gauge functions are just integer powers of epsilon, so it's a very simple example here. And then you just substitute this regular perturbation expansion into your differential equations, and then you get the order one problem, the order epsilon problem, order epsilon squared, and so forth. So here they are, boundary conditions and everything. And then we solve those. I'm just showing the first three here and you get the U1, U2, U3, and however many you have patients to, to get. So you have your asymptotic expansion. Okay, so from classical asymptotic methods, we're done. Okay, that's the best we can do. And you use these, you compare it against exact solution or other solutions if you have them, and you see how good or bad your asymptotic solution is. So now what we wanna do is, is put this in the context of a Galerkin projection method. Okay, so now our trial function, just like before, u bar is the RPM, I'll call them RPM coefficients now, the CN coefficients, times the basis functions. The basis functions here, here are gonna include both the gauge functions, and this is really where the power comes into this approach, is because the small parameter, the epsilon, the, the physical parameter in the system, is contained within the basis function. So the, one of the big problems with reduced order methods based on POD is every time you change the system in any way, so just change the parameters for the solution, you have to redo the calculation of the POD modes and then redo your ROM, your reduced order model. Here, the parameter, in this case epsilon, is contained within the, that dependence is contained within the basis functions. So it's the gauge functions times the UN, each order gives you the basis functions. And then we have the usual linear combination of those through the CN, I'll call those CNs the RPM coefficients. So again, as you can now more clearly see, when the Cs are one, the trial function is the asymptotic expansion. Okay, so that's again a good check. So once we do the RPM, get the, the RPM coefficients, we should get one as epsilon goes to zero. So I'll show you that that is indeed the case. The other nice thing is, this kind of a side benefit from an asymptotics point of view, is one of the problems with asymptotics is you get your solution, and, and again, it's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful on paper, how good is it? The only way to check how good your asymptotic expansion is, is to compare it against numerical solutions or experimental solutions or something else. But this gives us an internal consistency check because the RPM coefficients give us a quantitative measure of the accuracy of, of the asymptotics itself. So the farther away the Cs are from one, the less accurate your asymptotic expansion is. So that, that's nice, and we'll see that that works out. Okay, so you have your asymptotic basis functions, and then we have our residual. So this is just standard Galerkin projection. You have your residual, L u bar minus f, and then we project the residual onto, which is basically the, the equation, differential equation, onto each of our asymptotic basis functions, and that's an orthogonal projection. They're equal to zero for each of them. 
Okay, so then when you do the Galerkin projection to get your reduced physics model, you get an n by n system of algebraic equations, in this case, because it's, because it's steady, there's no time dependence. So that, that's your RPM. So here's a, a, a long list of results. So this is just for four asymptotic basis functions. I showed you the first three, but I'm using the first four here. And then, so you can see their coefficients, C1, C2, C3, and C4 for a series of epsilons. So again, it's only in the limit as epsilon goes to zero that the asymptotic solution by itself has any meaning, and that's given here. So this is the L2 norm of the error of the asymptotic expansion as compared to the exact solution of the differential equation. And you can see as, as epsilon gets bigger in order one, it's, it's horrible, it's just terrible as, as you would expect. It's only as it go, epsilon goes towards zero that these solutions have any, any meaning at all. The last column here is the L2 norm of the error from the RPM solution. So it's the same underlying asymptotic terms from the asymptotic expansion as their asymptotic basis functions, but now run through the Galerkin projection process. And now we get solutions that are quite a bit better. So you'll notice up to about three, an epsilon of three, our RPM is about two orders of magnitude better in terms of the air than the, just the asymptotic expansion by itself. So that's pretty impressive. So the other thing you'll notice is the first thing I, I mentioned before was that as epsilon goes to zero, these coefficients we expect to go to one, and, and indeed they do. So the Galerkin projection process is consistent with this, and it all makes sense from that point of view. Okay, so let's, let's look at uh, some, I basically ran through that. Uh, but really this is what I wanna highlight. So no additional information is necessary. Once you have the asymptotic basis functions from the asymptotic expansion, you don't need any additional information, just run it through the Galerkin projection, and you can essentially leverage the asymptotic solution into a much more accurate solution at higher, larger values of, of epsilon. It's very powerful. So here's just a couple of graphical examples of epsilon of one and two for the same four basis, asymptotic basis functions. So here's the exact solution, which is the solid line. The asymptotic solution is this dashed line. And then the RPM solution is dotted, which you can't see because it's right on top of the, the exact solution for both of these cases. And so by epsilon of one, as you'd expect, the asymptotic solution no longer agrees with the exact solution. For epsilon of two, it's not even qualitatively correct. I mean, it's qualitatively incorrect. However, using those as asymptotic basis functions, running it through the Galerkin projection, we get a, a very good agreement, even up to order one epsilons with the exact solution. So let's look at a more interesting singular perturbation illustration. I'll go through this one more quickly, uh, but this is more indicative of a multi-scale kind of problem. And so now what I want to emphasize is what happens as epsilon goes to zero, because that's when the singular behavior kicks in, that's when you have the large gradients in your solution because of multi-scale behavior and so forth. And so that's where I want to show you how powerful this becomes. So uh, again, we'll see that as you increase epsilon, it, it does give you a pretty good solution for larger values of epsilon, but not as dramatic as the regular perturbation example. So here's the equation, almost the same as before, boundary conditions and equation are essentially the same, but I've moved the epsilon, the small parameter, onto the high, highest derivative term now, second derivative term, so now you lose your second order when epsilon is zero, so it's the singular perturbation problem. When you get the distinguished limit, you find that there's an order epsilon thin boundary layer at the left boundary, and you'll see that in the plots. And so we use matched asymptotic expansions to get the outer solution when x is order one, the inner solution when x is order epsilon, beautifully match them together, and to get the composite, uniformly valid composite solution. So again, same idea. Uh, now I'm only gonna use two, so just the first two asymptotic basis functions. And so the, the two coefficients here, C1 and C2, with, with increasing epsilon, these two columns are the same as before, so the L2 norm of the error of the asymptotic expansion by itself and of the error for the RPM solution with the Galerkin projection. And so you'll notice that, of course, again, as epsilon gets smaller, the coefficients get close to one, as we expect. 
the agreement is very good, the RPM solution's better than the asymptotic solution by itself, up to a certain point, and I'll, I'll tell you on the next slide, I'll show you on the next slide why there's a limit to how, how big the epsilon can get. But the, the really powerful thing is, look at this last column now. So this is, if you just use a standard spectral method, Chebyshev polynomials, and you say, I want the same level of accuracy from my standard spectral method as I'm getting from my two-term RPM solution. So that's the question I'm asking. So for an epsilon of 0.5, I need five Chebyshev polynomials compared to my two. But look what happens as I decrease epsilon. So just in your mind, think about what's going on with the spectral method. So as I'll show you in the next slide, the boundary layer is getting thinner and thinner, the gradients are getting larger and larger, and that's, of course, characteristically where spectral methods break down. So you need a huge number of, of basis functions, terms, in order to get an accurate solution from a spectral method. In fact, the exact opposite is the case using asymptotic basis functions, because the asymptotic basis functions are, indeed, the exact solution of the differential equation in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So that's why I can get away with this with only two. So with only two, I go from five up to almost needing 40 Chebyshev polynomials to get the same level of accuracy as I do with my RPM solution for a small epsilon as the singularity is approached. So again, that's really the, the beauty of the, the multi-scale aspect. So here's the solution plotted for you for 0.02. So you can see the thin boundary layer on the left side here near zero. For 0.1, the boundary layer gets thicker. And so you can even see here, if you look closely, this is the problem with the singular perturbation problems as epsilon increases, your boundary layer is no longer thin, and you're, of course you get yourself into trouble. So, so that's just the nature of singular perturbation problems. So really the power is as epsilon gets smaller, you actually get more accurate solutions with fewer terms rather than less accurate solutions with more terms, as typically the case in projection methods. Okay, so in terms of conclusions, we've uh, demonstrated a a novel source of basis functions using asymptotic expansions. We call them asymptotic basis functions. And the point here is they're capturing the dependence of the problem on that small parameter. And that's really the value, I think, in these model-driven approaches as compared to the data-driven approaches. And this is where the power comes in for multi-scale problems because as the small parameter gets smaller, the gradients get larger, that's when this comes into its own. That's when this really will show its advantages. And I've said a lot more about this in the paper, uh, so you can look at that, but just a couple points on, on this, this approach as it relates to ROM-based methods. So in a sense, you can just think of this as another source of basis functions, right? So we have multiple sources. You either select them, data-driven. This is a model-driven approach. Fine. But they're more physically based. They contain information about the physics of the problem within the basis functions, including, like I keep emphasizing, the dependence on that, that parameter. In terms of an asymptotic methods point of view, which is kind of my heritage, and this is what excites me about this, is it kind of resurrects all those classical asymptotic expansions we have for some of these interesting problems, because now we can extend their validity to a much broader range of the parameter epsilon, which I think has a lot of potential. Then also we have uh, the RPM coefficients, again, providing a quantitative measure of how good or bad your asymptotic expansion is. What is the validity as epsilon goes up? That's always been a notorious problem. Everyone always asks us in conferences, and you can't answer the question unless you have outside information to, to do so. Here, it's an internal check. So again, I've shown through the regular and singular perturbation illustrations that it is consistent with the projection process because the, the, the coefficients do go to one as epsilon goes to zero. And for the regular perturbation problem in particular, as the quote unquote small parameter becomes even order one, we can still get very good accurate solutions with just a small number of basis functions. And then for the singular problems, again, the, the real power there is as epsilon goes to zero, as the problem becomes more singular and traditional projection methods break down, the asymptotic basis functions actually get better and better. So this, again, model-driven approach, and it's at the intersection of these, these various techniques. I didn't really get into the variational aspect of this in the, in the talk, but it's in the paper. And again, I just want to emphasize 
This all comes from the equation itself. I don't need any data. And this is, I think, the promise in general, these model-driven approaches, is that we don't need data. Okay, we can get this information directly from the model. It's hard, it's not, it does, it's not universal. That's the great thing about data is we always have data. We don't always have models. But when you do have a model, this is one way to take maximum advantage of it. And I'll just close with this just very quickly. So I, I'm not panning data-driven methods, but what I want to do is develop more model-driven methods to complement those. And I think because they both can then feed through the projection process, and that's kind of the, the common aspect to all of this, we can even then combine these through Coleman filtering data simulation. So in cases where you have very limited data and good models or very good data, limited models, that we can combine the best of both through this Galerkin projection framework. I think it's very powerful, has a lot of potential. Thank you.